Hi everybody and welcome to another English Lab video called The Texts in 10 where we aim to equip you with a range of ideas and ways of thinking about the comparative pair of texts that you're looking at in order to really help you out with your reading of the text and also with your studying and your writing of essays for them. My name is Ben Taylor and today I'm going to be talking to you about The Crucible and The Dressmaker which is a fantastic pair to be studying and a really popular one too and I'm going to be taking you through what we think are three really key things that you need to be considering if you're going to be looking to go further with your analysis. And so to start off with, the first idea that we're going to look at is the idea of a moral or a social code that is followed across the dressmaker and the crucible. And how this happens in a way where it leads to people excluding others and a way of social exclusion in a way of looking at what is accepted and unaccepted behaviour within a society. And so when we look at that, when we're looking to get as much out of this idea as we can, we obviously need to look at who is involved in this the people that are excluded, the people that benefit from this type of exclusion, and the way in which people within a society will organise themselves in a manner where they will all follow that same sort of code. Now when I say, say the word code, I mean this uh, understood way of living, these guidelines, these rules that they all seem to follow. And so we need to look at not only who um, it benefits from these types of things, but why these things might exist as well. And that's going to inform what we're going to talk about in the rest of the video. So when we take a look at it, let's take a look at the people that exclu are excluded. And of course, with the dressmaker, the first person we think of is Tilly Dunnage and her mother. And this idea that we have this rigorous understanding of what is morally right in the town of Dungatar, and that when Molly fell short of that, she was excluded from the town. Now, Ham really makes this point clear through the physical uh, location of where Molly lives, you know, up on the hill, next to the tip, like the McSwineys, who are also probably not to the same extent, but who are also excluded due to their socioeconomic status. And so that idea of the central people of Dungatar and the idea of how they see themselves and who falls short of their expected behaviours is telling in the way in which they look to uh, have a vision of themselves and how they live their lives in a moral way. What's telling about this though, what's more interesting, is who these characters are that benefit from it and characters like Evan Pettyman, who we see in an extremely negative light through his you know, despicable actions. But what's interesting about that fact is that he isn't excluded from the town. So we take a look at, even though the women um, you know, will cross the street in, as a matter to get away from him and so on, he's not openly criticised. So having a little bit of a think and digging a bit deeper there could really open your ideas, uh, open up your eyes to what it is that leads people to exclude each other from these towns, but also what it is to being included and who benefits from that. Of course, the people of Salem aren't immune from this either, and even characters that we see as being very morally upright, such as Goody Proctor, fall victim to this sort of behaviour. She talks about her own, you know, keeping a good home and raising her boys and being a good wife and so on, and, and you know, never telling a lie and these types of things. And yet she sees herself where she says, you know, I'm not stumbling around drunk and half-witted like Goody Osborne. This idea that to be moral and to be upstanding and to be doing the right thing can also come about from the exclusion and the criticism of others. That we have a clear idea of expected behaviour and a clear expectations from each other in how we are going to live our lives in this morally just way. And those that don't reach up to those standards are excluded. So we can see that there's a uh, different, uh, that there's a, quite a big similarity there, but we want to always make sure that we're going further than just the similarities. We can't get to the end of our work, be it an essay or whatever we're writing, and merely say, these two texts are saying the same thing. So where we can see a difference there is the way in which uh, the characters follow these codes and how in the Crucible, you know, we're, the people of Salem, this is a Puritan society, this is a, a theocracy that they're living in. And so this code is obviously religious, it's obviously based and rooted in this religious understanding of uh, what is morally right and a fear of God and judgment and heaven and hell and all of these types of things. It's a very rigorous code. But 
what's interesting is that even though that doesn't exist in a clear and obvious way for the people of Dungata, they still follow that same sort of idea. And even though religion or church or anything like that is never actually explicitly mentioned, so there isn't this one over commanding uh, rule of, of law or any way that people want to, to, to follow these moral rules, they still organize themselves in a manner where we have a clear expectation of those who are in and those who are out. And so that leads to our second idea, and this is the idea of mob mentality. And so we can think of other synonyms for this about scapegoating or to be seen as part of a herd. Uh, and of course, it also comes with the idea of excluding, that if we're going to exclude people, if we're going to see ourselves as a group, then we're going to have this very mob mentality. And so what's interesting here is that I don't want to talk too much about so much what uh, Ham or Miller say about a mob mentality, because I think there's plenty that you'll all have you thought of with that, but rather we can think about how these things come together. If we think about the dressmaker, we can think about in the early chapters for the first time that we've read it, we're not exactly familiar with who the characters exactly are and what the difference between Beulah Haradine or uh, Marigold Pettyman is and, and who this woman Molly is and, and Tilly and who she's become and so on. But it quickly becomes clear as the novel progresses and Ham moves from her descriptions of individuals and being in these houses of these individuals to slowly begin to discuss the people of Dungata as a whole. And the evidence that we can have to support that is that she uses phrases such as the women of Dungata when she's talking about the way in which they appear in their frocks and so on at those social outings. Of course, we also have Sergeant Farrett referring to them as his flock. This idea of these lambs that have all come together because, uh, you know, of what they're scared of or whatever it might be, but they're, they've all flocked together and that they can be seen as this group that can perhaps even be pitied. We also see this through um, the crucible and through uh, a couple of different things that Miller does. And this really helps us understand the psyche of the people of Salem and, and how Miller wants us to think about them. I'd really be making sure if I were you that you read the prologue because so much of what Miller is trying to say about why he has written this play, and that's obviously what we want to get to at the base of it all, is outlined there in the prologue. And one of the things that is said is about how the American continent stretched endlessly west. And so we get this idea of these people huddled up on the east coast of America in this tiny pocket of land with this forest next to them, this virgin forest, and everything that existed beyond that was the devil, was evil, was uh, unknown, and was feared. And so when we start to look at that, we can start to understand how these people organized themselves where they created a mob, and that it came out of a need for safety, and a need for comfort, and a need for inclusion. And so when that comes about, we can think about the people people of Dungata in a similar way. Even though these stories are centuries apart, the people of Dungata are isolated from many other people as well. This shiny beacon in a vast black sea, and we can see that in comparison to stretching out as far as the silos. There's this definite idea about Dungata being this isolated town where people are going to cling to each other in order for comfort and for safety in numbers. And so when we think about that, we need to think about how one can only pity them all. And so we start to view them as a group rather than just individuals and start to actually pity them in the way in which we look at them and see that there is a reason for this behavior. And even though there are tragic consequences of this, we can see how it came about due to the fear that exists that fuels so much of this. Again, when we're looking for differences over just similarities, I want you to think about what is learned from either text. And there's a great couple of pages at the end of the Crucible that talks about the feeling within the town of Salem and who has fled and the, the, the chance of rebellion that are coming up on the streets and the idea and the questioning of, of authority and of God is starting to creep into the people of Salem as they've seen these horrific events unfold. And I want you to compare that to the scene where the bus comes back to Dungatar and they find their town burned to the ground. And what's learned? And, and I'd, I'd, I'd make the argument that not a whole lot is learned and that there's not a lot of introspection or personal growth from any of these people in the way in which they see their role in all the madness that has overtaken them. 
And so with those first two ideas, we now get to number three, which is really just extending on, uh, on those first two. And that is looking at the manner in which people will conceal or suppress parts of themselves and who they really are. And of course, we can see this uh, very clearly in the opening of The Crucible with the girls dancing around the fire and this idea of them expressing themselves because of this built up um, oppression and of living in that town and that very strict moral code that they all must follow. Of course, in Ungata, we have Sergeant Farrett, who is um, described to have a secret locked cupboard. So as these things that exist within his house and that exist within him, that uh, he needs to keep secret, that he needs to keep concealed from the rest of the town. Obviously with Farrett, he gets to the stage where he doesn't care, where he understands that people may have seen things on the clothesline uh, over the years, and he reaches a point where he goes beyond having that care about what other people may think of him. However, this idea of being concealing and suppressing who we really are is something that's explored by both texts in a way of showing the dangers of it and that when we look at mob mentality and having this moral code, that these things may have been designed or people might fall into them in a way of staying safe and having safety in numbers and a comfort and an idea of the way in which we should live our lives. But what does that come at the expense of? And what we see there is that with the concealment of, of, of um, pleasure and the concealment of who we really are and, and our desires and who we want to be, it leads to madness and it leads to misery. And so we can uh, take that further to really think a group behavior and mob mentality and looking for, looking for safety and so on. It can come at the expense of the individual and how they feel. Again, with the differences that we look for there, we can see in the Crucible that perhaps we could have more pity for the people of the Crucible. Now, you're probably not going to use that in your essay. In fact, I'd advise you not to. It's not about you evaluating uh, whether we should feel more sorry for one than the other. This is more just to get you thinking in a certain way that the people of Salem were at the mercy of a God that yes, they believed in and that they had but they had very clear ideas of the devil and heaven and hell. And then they had these figures that came in, the, this God on earth in you know, Danforth and Hawthorne that came in and delivered this justice, this brutal justice. And so there was, in that way, it was much more something that was done to these people, that they were at the mercy of a religion, that they were at the mercy of people who uh, thought they were God on earth. And they, they were at the mercy of uh, this fear that overtook so many of them. And we can see that in, um, in contrast to the people of Dungatar, who instead of having this done to them, are all very much responsible for what ends up happening. That all of the tragic events at the end with the town being um, you know, burned to the ground and with the madness that overtakes them in the lead up to their awful rendition of Macbeth, we see that all of this is of their own making. And so we can go further with that to start thinking about whether any of them have any form of introspection and any growth from that to see the dangers of what they've fallen into or whether they remain ignorant of that. Further evidence to support that is at uh, Teddy McSwiney's funeral where Sergeant Farrett lays out this is what happens as a result of, uh, of your hatred and so on and the message is completely lost on them. And so that's just three ways for you to think about this text. We've really just focused on the group and the mob mentality. There's obviously so much more that we could say, but we wanted to keep this as brief as possible. So uh, if you have any further questions, please put them in the comments section. Our uh, thinking behind this YouTube channel is that we're here to help and support you and to provide you with some uh, new ways of thinking about the texts, but we wanna be really interactive. So if you have any uh, questions or comments that you have about the video, perhaps you think there's some evidence that was really obvious that we glossed over and that we missed out on today, perhaps you'd like to challenge something that I've said. We'd welcome that there in the comments if you feel that there's something that you see a little bit differently about either of these. But if you do have any comments or questions, please make sure you put them there below. Uh, we'll be uh, here again in the future with further videos to help you out, not just with The Crucible and The Dressmaker. We're looking to do uh, some sample essays and some sample paragraphs and some smaller things about looking at this pair. Uh, so there will be subsequent videos, but there will also be videos coming up for your Section A text, as well as some language analysis material that should really help you out in the lead up for your end of year exam. If you want to be able to uh, kept up to date with all of those things, just hit subscribe and that way you'll be uh, subscribed to the English Lab channel and you'll receive notifications and you'll easily be able to get to all of the content that you want to be able to get to to help you there with your study. 
If you know of anybody else uh, that is studying this pair, please make sure that you like our video and, and, and share it with them so that they can uh, get on board with the message as well. We also have uh, videos for the other seven pairs. So if you have friends at other schools that would like to view those, there's also the opportunity for them. So until then, thanks very much for watching today. I hope you've got a lot out of it. Please make sure you ask any questions if you'd like to get more out of us. And until next time, all the best with your studying.